my honor to introduce our esteemed guest today, whose bios you see in the chat. Um, our panel really hopes to draw connections between individual hate crimes and the systems of policing that connect anti-Asian violence to deportation, to mass incarceration, and of course, to the police murders of black people in the United States. And I wanna acknowledge how difficult it is to have this conversation in the wake of so much ongoing loss of life. Uh, following the shootings at Three Massage Spas in Atlanta a bit over a month ago, while we grieved, expressed outrage and mobilized, Sarat Song was the very first person to remind me and continually offers these generous reminders on a near daily basis um, that just two days before the shooting, a plane deported 33 Vietnamese American refugees to Vietnam after some had lived in the US for decades. So while President Biden has been praised for swift, swift calls to pass anti-hate crimes legislation, his administration has, also, has actively endorsed deportation. And I hope our panel today is posed as a critical conversation for how it grapples with these specific kinds of erasures while holding space for the enormous outpouring of grief for anti-Asian violence that has targeted particularly women and elders. One way that the nation has sought to understand and process the invisible types of interpersonal violence that Asian and Asian Americans have faced is through data. Last summer, our second speaker, Vivian Shaw, launched the AAPI COVID-19 project, one of the largest data collection projects around Asian American experiences with violence, employment, discrimination, and health equity during the pandemic. And I think it's recently been recognized by um, UNESCO, among others, but Vivian can share. Vivian is also co-author of the Asian American Feminist Antibodies Zine, which I really encourage you all to check out, a collaboration with the Asian American Feminist Collective and Blue Stockings Magazine. Our final speaker holds critical answers for how we convey all of this knowledge to our youth. Chanda Womack, the founder and ED of the Alliance for Alliance of Rhode Islands for South Alliance of Rhode Islands for Southeast Asians Education will share lessons around building youth power through education and organizing. Arise Youth have been a part of the phenomenal Counselors Not Cops campaign to remove SROs from high schools, which actually has a huge action in Providence tomorrow that I hope John will talk about. Um, and our part uh, or and are part of a group of students who have sued the state of Rhode Island for their right to access to civics education. I can't think of a better person to outline for us concrete ways of moving forward locally here in Providence and to reverberate more broadly from wherever audience members may be joining us. And lastly, it's a joy to introduce my co-moderator, Bob Lee, who I'm honored to call a friend, mentor, and colleague. In my mind, this is the first of many retirement events we will plan for Bob to honor his legacy in building Asian American studies at Brown and for his enduring scholarship. Brown formally retires at the end of next month after nearly five decades of work on Brown's campus. He also holds the record as the Providence Youth Student Movement's longest um, standing board member and is a current board member um, of a rise. So there's a beautiful connection here. So I can't think of a better person uh, to offer a bit of historical context for our event. And on that note, pass it over to Professor Lee. Um, thank you so much uh, for that very generous introduction, Elena, and, and for organizing this panel, uh, and to Stephanie for hosting us, and to Trey, uh, Caitlin, and, and Soraya, Lewis, and Jason for doing all the scaffolding work uh, that makes this kind of um, event possible. Um, I just want to make uh, a couple of observations that might help us frame uh, the present moment. Um, the current pattern of racial violence uh, against Asian people is not limited to any one ethnic group or region in the United States. You can be Korean in Atlanta, Filipino in New York, Thai in Oakland, or Sikh in Indianapolis, and still be attacked and killed by racist who doesn't think you belong here uh, because of the way you look or speak, uh, or because they think you're some other kind of Asian they happen to hate. Racial violence uh, against Asians is a continuous pattern throughout uh, the history of Asian, Asian communities in the United States. And you could have been one of the six Khmer or Vietnamese first and second graders uh, killed 
or among the 28 other Southeast Asian children shot down in their schoolyard in Stockton, California uh, in 1989 by a racist who, re who resented Asian, ref Asian refugees uh, taking seats at the local community college and had a Rambo revenge fantasy. The Cleveland school murders uh, raised a storm over gun control and mental health, uh, but few thought about how it fit into a long history of uh, racial violence against Asians in the United States. From the lynching of 17 Chinese men and one woman in Los Angeles in 1871, still the largest uh, mass lynching uh, in US history, uh, to massacres in places like Rock Spring, Wyoming, or Snake River, Oregon, or Hanapepe, Hawaii, or Oak Creek, Wisconsin. So throughout the US history, uh, for over uh, a century, uh, we've seen massacres, not unlike the one that happened in Atlanta, uh, happen all over the country um, to Asians of all ethnicities. The long history of, Asia, of violence against Asians in the United States, I want to argue, actually begins in Asia and the Pacific. The United States has been at war in the Pacific and in Asia continuously for over 200 years, right? Um, we can't begin to understand the Atlanta massacre unless we understand the My Lai massacre in Vietnam or the cultures of sexual exploitation and violence that surround um, scores of US military bases in Korea, the Philippines, Okinawa, throughout Asia and the Pacific. Okay. Finally, I wanna suggest that we might understand the long pattern of racial violence against Asians in the United States as a form of vigilantism, which enlists private individuals into the practice of state violence that includes war, occupations and incarceration uh, abroad, occupations abroad and incarceration and deportation at home that seeks to cleanse America of aliens uh, and to restore an imagined uh, racial national purity. So at, at this time, it, it's my pleasure to turn over um, the program to Sarath. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Elena. Appreciate and love you both. Um, and thanks to CSRA, CSREA and the tech team for holding it down. Um, and everybody else, Arun Suasdai, greetings. My name is Sarat Saranai Sum, he, him, his. I'm National Director of Southeast Asian Freedom Network. I'm queer, I'm Khmer, and I'm refugee. So during the American War in Southeast Asia, or what we call here the Vietnam War, my family fled Cambodia after the US military left. I was born in the largest refugee camp at the Thai border of Pao Dang. And we immigrated to Boston when I was five, where I learned about community organizing. I moved to Providence for college at Brown University, fell in love with um, the people in the communities here in Providence, and after college, co-founded Providence Youth Student Movement, or PRISM, we found a prison in 2001 to respond to the ways in which Southeast Asian young people were pushed out of schools and into prisons, many into deportation pipeline. And we need a space for young Southeast Asian people, queer and trans youth of color, and survivors of state violence to organize, to come together and organize against state violence. And, um, and after 18 years, um, this year I transitioned to my current role as National Director at Southeast Asian Freedom Network. Also, the a founding co uh, a founding um, uh, co director for the board um, to, of Arise. So shout out to Arise, and y'all gonna hear about it later. That's a Shanda. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you all. I'm also a little nervous, so bear with me. Um, first, just Happy New Year, Association of Tamai. This month is a special one for Cambodians as we celebrate Cambodian New Year, Khmer New Year, as well as Lao, Thai, and other Southeast and South Asian communities. It's a time for us to enjoy the harvest of our labor, to celebrate each other, to come together, and to give and receive blessings for the year ahead. I wish for all of us the blessings of safety, of healing, and of unity. So my main goal today um, is to uh, talk about um, 
state violence, to talk about Southeast Asians and our relationship with state violence. Um, and I want to just, um, you know, so my main goal is to say state violence is anti-Asian hate. And I'll be talking about the South Asian experience and the deportation to talk about this case. So first I want to talk about Southeast Asians. Um, so to begin with, I want to take some time uh, to show a video that Stephen produced years ago to talk about our communities, um, to make a case when we look at the Southeast Asian experience that there's no greater perpetrator of violence against us than violence enacted by the state. Um, so uh, yeah, so can y'all show the video? To end deportation and displacement and reunite our families, we have to start from the beginning and ask ourselves, where do we come from and why are we here in the first place? What started as U.S. military aid in the early 1950s escalated to wars that stretched across two decades, impacted the lives of millions of people and dominated the landscapes of three Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. What caused my family to come to America? U.S. imperialism, capitalism, war, governments fighting each other, men having no regards for people and for families. You know, U.S. greed in Southeast Asia at the time. So a lot of those factors, I think, caused my family and the hundreds of thousands of other Southeast Asian refugees to come to the United States. What brought us here was, was, that, was I think, um, U.S. foreign policy, um, uh, U.S. military policy, as well as an internal struggle in Vietnam um, that was creating a lot of conditions. My mom and dad and all my uncles and aunties, they recall the war. They recall their, their experience fleeing from, from the, the only home that they knew. Like every other family during the 80s, we ran away from war, getting slaughtered. Because Cambodia became a war torn country, and to seek safety, we have to escape. We just have to come because we. War. Our country have war, have civil war, kill each other. How many millions of people die in Cambodia in that, uh, 1975 to 79? Almost 3 million people die. I didn't know, you know. I always felt like it was an honor to be here um, until I did a little bit of research and I, f I found out that they bombed the hell out of us. There was a secret bombing campaign um, in Laos. Their experience was definitely influenced by the war that the U.S. decided to take part in. Um, so I think their, their choice, what brought them here was so out of survival. While the Vietnam War ended in 1975, more than three million people would risk their lives over the next 25 years, fleeing hostile regimes in Vietnam and Laos and escaping a genocide in Cambodia. They left under the cover of night, whole families escaping by foot or boat through jungles and across rivers and oceans towards refugee camps in neighboring countries. Untold hundreds of thousands died in their attempts to flee. My parents were refugees from Vietnam, so they left on a boat and um, with my older sister and my other sister was, my mom was pregnant. A lot of people that are older than me that got raped from the soldier and we stay in the camp, they raped us in the camp because we have no power. After like half of our fellow um, uh, Cambodian who escaped around the same time died along the, um, you know, along the road and in the jungle. My mom and dad decided that uh, they should leave Laos. I was actually born in a refugee camp, so um, I was born on the way. Uh, moms and pops spent 14 months in the jungle escaping the genocide. Uh, finally got to um, Chonburi, Thailand re refugee camp where I was born at. Everyone flee, you know, from uh, uh, Cambodia to Thailand, you know, we, 
They stay in the refugee camp for years. My father actually applied for political asylum in a lot of different countries. Uh, I actually have a copy of letters that he wrote to like Australia, England, the United States. So the displacement of our communities began. Over 2.5 million Vietnamese, Cambodian, Hmong, Mien, Lao, Montagnards, and others were resettled in places like North America, Europe, Australia, and South America, seeking safety, refuge, and peace. My parents loved me and my siblings enough that they would cross the fucking jungles to make sure that we would survive. And that's the most powerful form of love that I know. You know, the love that saves lives, the love that transforms communities, the love that keep us alive. Being able to say, you can't break me, you know, and not just the Vietnamese community, but the Southeast Asian community. They tried to break us down, you know what I mean? They tried to murder us, but here we are. I look at the genocide and, you know, it's really traumatic, but at the same time, I'm like, who the fuck can come out of that situation? come to a different country, make a life. Who can do that? You know, I don't, that's just crazy. Like, who can do that? After having your home taken away from you, all your money, your family, everything that you know, and basically getting thrown into this life in this country and just trying to make it work, and how much people fight to make it work, I think is something to really admire in our community and be proud of. This is, this is going to shift the narrative. Um, and it's going to, I think, hold the U.S. accountable in a way that um, is not just about capital, that's not just about, you know, how many land was lost and things like that, but really about the human cost of war and violence. On October 24, 2015, the Southeast Asian Freedom Network and One Love launched our new campaign. Across 15 cities in the U.S. and Cambodia, folks held gatherings in their kitchens and living rooms, in temples and pho shops, with family, friends, and allies to watch the CFIN campaign launch video and discuss how we can move forward together as a community to end deportation and displacement and reunite our families. CFIN. One love. All around the world. Let's go. Despite the deadliest of weapons embedded in genetics, the love so pure beyond any scale of metrics, the strongest love keeps us alive, keeps hearts warm in the cold world. I would never forget it, unapologetic, gotta learn where you're from to know where you're headed. Life's a great journey, don't stop believing. When they throw dirt, remember you will see. Follow your roots, it'll lead you back home. That's where you find peace, we've been lost for too long. Reclaim your history, Southeast Asian child. You could be proud, think back and smile. Though the past can be painful, this is what made you the way that the world couldn't break you. However long it takes you, enjoy every step of the road. Embrace the ugly, the beauty every story and told. No can be sold, no purchase. Priceless, but far from worthless. Yeah, we heal just like the earth does. Scattered everywhere across the universe. And we still gonna make it work. They can break us down Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, but there's always a lot for me to, to, to take in um, and to watch. Um, but I, I would be really important to, to, to show you all the conditions that let us here. So what? So I just want to start off by saying, that, like, so how do we? What do I mean by Southeast Asian? Um, and I want to be clear that we mean um, that. Southeast Asian of folks um, who were displaced in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam as a result of U.S. militarism in the 60s and 80s. This includes Cambodian, Khmer folks, Lao folks, Vietnamese, Hmong, as well as hundreds of other ethnic indigenous stateless tribes from those countries. And why is this important? So for us, in the past few decades that we've been here, we built this identity to make a sense of our position in U.S. racial capitalism um, and the movement against it. We built this identity to name U.S. imperialism as perpetrators of violence um, against us and the cause of our homeland's destruction. We built this identity to, to create a way forward for us as refugees to make sense of why we are here. So what happened after we came, right? So after we became refugees, uh, we arrived to a country that tried to destroy us, to a country that tried to forget about us. Um, so, you know, so the, the U.S. brought out our community here, our folks here, um, through the Refugee Resettlement Program and the Refugee Resettlement Act of 1980. They failed to deliver on its promise to really stabilize our community. 
We were brought to the U.S. as part of the largest refugee resettlement program in the U.S. history, which included over 1.4 million refugees from, the, from Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Um, they promised to resettle us, and instead abandoned us. Um, and we were subjected to the same systemic marginalization as many other communities of color in the U.S., often referred to as the school, the prison, to deportation pipeline. Um, we were resettled in, um, in communities and neighborhoods with failing schools, with uh, over-policing and under-resourced. Um, and, um, and we tried our best to survive. We came together to survive. Um, we came together to form chosen families and to protect each other. And then we were labeled gangs. And then we were thrown out of schools, into prisons, and into immigration detention, and then deported back to a country where the U.S. destroyed. Which then sort of brings us brings me back to um, the which brings us then to the deportation crisis. So Southeast Asian deportation is a result of the U.S. Um, unjust immigration criminal legal systems which intersect the criminalized community along with other poor immigrant communities of color. Um, the immigration and criminal legal systems intersect to really punish our people for deportations. Uh, most of our impacted community members are green hot holders, but they face deportation based on criminal convictions and past criminal convictions. Um, so we say that deportations are unjust and violent, and they re-traumatize the South Asian community. Um, they, fi they, fi they financially destabilize our families who are often already struggling to make ends meet. And emotionally, deportations add further stress to families who are often struggling with mental health challenges such as depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. There are 16,000, there are over 16,000 South Asians with orders of removal in this country. Um, and many of them are green hard holders and lived here for most of our lives. Um, so our, our community continues to be vulnerable to detention and deportation under the new Biden administration. We know how awful um, the past four years were. Um, but for the past 20 years, South Asian deportations have taken place under both Republican and Democratic administrations. The Biden administration is no different. Um, it's, uh, even though there's that 100 day pause of deportation, it does not exclude those with criminal conviction. And it still allows ICE to arrest and detain those who've already finished their sentences. So instead of allowing people to reunite with their families, this temporary policy continues to target those that have already suffered through the criminal legal system. And as we keep on seeing, oftentimes uh, refugees and immigrants with criminal conviction get thrown under the bus for what, see, or for what seems as more progressive uh, immigration legislation. So we must work towards a new immigration system. Um, so, because you know, our, our system here is, is totally understood through the lens of security, which is represented by the fact that immigration is housed under the Department of Homeland Security. And due to, the, I, and due to this, ICE is a rogue organization um, that sows that so fear and distrust in our communities. And it continues to commit human rights abuses. This is backwards. Our whole immigration system must be remade to center human rights, dignity, and safety. Um, so I just want to, um, so yeah, <clears throat> next slide, please. Sorry. So Southeast Asian resistance. So as if you know anything about Southeast Asians, we're also fighters. Um, so CFN, Southeast Asian Freedom was formed in 2001 to create a united front against the deportation of Cambodian Americans. Um, and since then, We've evolved and grown into a national movement family to, of local organizations dedicated to the mobilization of our communities towards abolition, right? We are queer, we are femme, and we are women-led. We built our movement and we do our work to understand that deportation and abolition is a queer and gender justice issue. That even though most of the people with the deportation orders are cis men, um, it is women, femme, and queer folks who have to pick up the pieces in our families and in our communities and do the organizing work to defend our brothers, our fathers, and our husbands. So what are we doing now? We're developing infrastructure to support the ecosystem of Southeast Asian organizations and formations, push them to the left, to help develop the analysis towards the right side of justice in this moment. And we're working to find alignment true solidarity with other communities through coalitions, campaigns, and movement building. We're working to make sure, we're, we're working to make sure that we show up and show out as accomplices in the larger fight for racial justice and Black liberation. And while we have not stopped Southeast Asian deportations yet, we've been able to keep hundreds of folks from being deported and got them out of prisons and detentions to be with their loved ones. Furthermore, we've been able to return five and counting um, deported folks back here to the, to the U.S. We won't stop until all of them are able to come home. So for CFAN, for our community, we've been here for over 40 years. 
we've been mobilizing, organizing for over 20 years, and we're still developing our analysis. Um, oftentimes, it's more questions. What is, oftentimes, we have more questions. Like, what is our stake in the fight for abolition? How can we use our position as South Asian refugees to disentangle the criminal legal system from the immigration system? How do we rebuild a just and humane immigration system that centers freedom of movement? And we are working hard to develop a South Asian politic, one that's rooted in anti-US imperialism, and one that's informed by Black radical tradition. And we've already been practicing this in our local communities and organizations. Ultimately, um, we have a vision of mobilizing South Asian refugee communities into the larger movement to abolish police and prisons, to tear down walls and borders, to give full reparations back to Black folks, give full reparations to Black folks, and to give back sovereignty of this land back to Native folk. So next slide, please. So in connecting it to the, to the current anti-Asian violence moment, um, you know, I just want to say straight up that the modern minority myth is a problem for Southeast Asians. It is harmful. It does not even rep does not represent us. The idea that all Asians are successful does not apply to Southeast Asians. We are in fact a myth in that modern minority. And because of the disinvestment over policing of our community and neighborhoods we live in, the South Asian community continues to experience many barriers that include criminalization. The modern minority myth masks the tension deportation crisis facing the community for the past 20 years. So South Asians experience classism, colorism, and our experiences are often swept under the rug of the modern minority. And what happens to us then don't get access. What happens is we don't get we don't get access to the resources we need to thrive. But because we are lumped under the category of Asian American, the recent waves of Asian anti-Asian violence has been also us. Right. Um, just for example, in that week in March, in the same week, there was a flight of Vietnamese refugees that were deported to Vietnam that Monday. That Wednesday was a was a shooting in Georgia, and then that following weekend we learned of at least four South Asian women, um, a South Asian woman who were killed by loved ones, all in the same week. And so, for many of us who are keeping track, of many of us who do work in these communities, us it was a really hard week, but it showed to us that really connect the layers from the individual to the systemic person. Um, so, as Asian American leaders and organizations and celebrities stupid celebrities are responding, we are pushing them to also understand that state violence is anti-Asian hate, that deportation is state violence against Asians, and that we cannot look at these acts of violence as individual incidents, that there are acts of white supremacy and that threat to not just Asians, but to all of us. And we are pushing them to think beyond the classroom of state as they cry out for more hate crime legislation that we know will only increase policing. And what we know in South Asian communities more policing does not mean more safety. And we must build more solidarity and unity between Asians and other people of color movements, and communities, join forces together to take down white supremacy. So all that to say, state violence is anti-Asian hate. And if you look at the case of my community for South Asians, then you have to understand that our organizing against ICE, against US militarism and imperialism, is a fight against anti-Asian hate that we, we must connect the individualized idea of what a hate crime is to the larger system of white supremacist, racial capitalism that thrives on violence against poor people, against people of color, and especially against black and native folks. And yes, even us, even Asians. I look forward to um, talking some more, but for now I wanna hand it over to Vivian. Thank you so much. Um, first, um, Elena and um, and uh, the Center for this wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm really glad to have followed the previous uh, presentation, which uh, started talking about some of these questions around uh, collaboration and cross racial solidarity. Uh, so these are some of the themes that have also, um, you know, come up in our project that we will be talking that I'll be talking about today. So um, today I'm just sharing some um, early findings from our research. Um, as Elena had mentioned, um, our project is a multi method project. We have about, um, I think, like 11 or 12 people on our team. We're mostly um, junior scholars. And um, our goal is really to capture multiple aspects of, um, of how the pandemic has been shaping the lives of Asian Americans, Asian immigrants, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. I'm, all, I'm gonna add a caveat to that in a second. Um, and so, uh, you know, we very early on, uh, we identified multiple themes um, 
such as labor inequality, such as health, education. Um, and we decided we wanted to explore, you know, multiple themes. Um, but just to kind of uh, begin into this very large field, we decided to narrow things down. And so our first studies are looking at labor um, and both the how the pandemic has impacted um, Asian American, Asian immigrants, um, and Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiians experiences of work, um, but also um, differences uh, that we can see, uh, you know, that correlate to socioeconomic status, right? And so, for instance, just to give you a very clear illustration, so um, as Elena had mentioned, I um, am um, a college fellow at Harvard, which means that I teach classes there. And so what that means for me from a labor perspective is that I have a salaried income that, um, that I can rely on, right? Um, and I can work at home, right? And so uh, that is a very different type of experience of the pandemic and of labor in general than people who have to go out into the public, um, have to either interface um, with uh, members of the public, you know, as shopkeepers or working in, um, you know, conditions that where there's great exposure uh, because of other workers as well, right? So these are, so we, we're very kind of interested in um, how, of how labor stratification is impacting these different experiences. And one of the starting points that um, we come to um, these questions with is uh, the um, understanding that anti-Asian racism, as was previously mentioned, is not simply uh, these very conspicuous acts of violence that we are hearing about, right? So I think that um, it's very clear that there's been a lot more attention to anti-Asian racism over the past year. Uh, the media has very much to do with that. Also, you know, celebrities speaking at social media. Um, but we really kind of question this idea that anti-Asian violence equals, um, you know, first of all, hate crime to kind of kind of challenge that language uh, to begin with, but also that um, that these very discreet um, overt acts of violence that we hear about in the media that we talk about, um, we think that to focus only on those um, is to kind of overlook uh, this, you know, much longer structures of inequality, the slow violence, which is kind of a concept used in environmental um, studies, um, of um, structural racism, right, which is embedded within immigration, which is embedded with histories of war, right? So we're coming to that from this perspective. The caveat I wanted to say that I had mentioned, you know, a minute ago is that, um, you know, we're still very much in a data collection period. And so there are a lot of gaps in our research. One of them being um, that, you know, given the nature of kind of our networks and how we have um, been able to start with uh, our recruitment, um, our sample skews East Asian, it skews um, people who um, have, uh, you know, not necessarily same kind of um, income level, but, um, you know, many people who have finished college, right? And so that's a major gap in our research that we are um, working on and which is why we're approaching this as a multi-year project because a lot of what we're trying to do is developing relationships uh, to work with different communities who can help us, you know, recruit people into the study that we can speak with. And another part of that is also, um, Pacific Islanders and uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, right? So oftentimes um, you're, you know, something that's very common right now is to see the hashtag stop API hate, right? Which is a controversial hashtag, um, which I don't think necessarily um, is super well known that that's a controversial hashtag, but part of why it is, is because um, in this sort of gesture towards solidarity to include uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, um, it actually creates this erasure, right? So I think I hope that at some point during this panel we'll have a conversation about um, what do these, you know, kind of well-meaning gestures of inclusion um, do, right? And how do they often reproduce um, these uh, moments of erasure, right? So uh, that's just something I want to start off by saying. So today in the um, in my talk. Um, I'm going to uh, just kind of focus on two different themes um, or two different, I guess, uh, uh, two different classes of themes, right? So one of them um, is, uh, so the first, one of the uh, kind of subcategories is, uh, has been the focus of our research, um, our kind of early preliminary findings report, as well as a resource guide. Um, and there's, a, you know, I have a, a, um, a, clue, um, a link to our website in the end where you can access this report. So we kind of um, draw from the interviews that we co conducted between um, June and October of last year and ended up with 40 interviews. 
uh, to kind of draw out some key themes. So those being risk assessment and also uneven impacts of anti-Asian racism, as well as uneven impacts of policy interventions. Uh, the second uh, kind of class of findings that I want to talk about um, are um, related to uh, Asian American political identity and Asian American um, responses to uh, thinking about other kind of issues uh, around racism or racial politics, right? So specifically Black Lives Matter. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about like why we focus on that. Um, and again, this is with a caveat that our sample is still very much a work in progress and we are trying to have greater representation, but right now, um, you know, it's, it's still work in progress, right? So that's just the thing I wanna share. So um, what we kind of talk about in our report, and also, sorry, the report also includes a resource guide at the end with a lot of different readings. Um, I, if, I don't think I'll have time to necessarily go through it, but um, we talk about, you know, we offer lists of readings, including academic articles, news articles, um, related to themes of gender, themes of, you know, different populations within kind of the broader Asian American uh, demographic. And then we also have a list of different organizations. So um, I would encourage you to check that out. So first, why are we talking about risk assessment? So one of the kind of key principles when we think about risk in the context of, um, of the pandemic um, and anti-Asian racism is that rather than people having uh, an ability to say no risk, or risk, right? It's not a binary risk or no risk, right? It is often a negotiation of what level of risk, right? And also which risks are you willing to accept uh, in order to avoid other risks, right? And so this is one way we're seeing that the, the kind of threat of anti-Asian racism is impacting people's negotiations of their risks in other contexts. Um, so, um, so for instance, um, we see in some of these quotes, um, and my, my slides are mostly going to be quotes, uh, one um, woman talking about how, um, you know, she's worried uh, when, that her child is worried that if they go outside, right, that they're going to have someone spit on them, right? So that's kind of one of the things. So she, also, she always has to kind of be conscious not only about her own safety, right, but also the safety for children. Um, another example that we have, and we have more quotes than this, but this is just kind of a sample, um, is somebody talking about her parents having um, a, um, a business where they sell um, Asian African goods, right? And so um, despite this kind of being at the height of the pandemic, they felt concerned about the potential um, fallout of enforcing a mask policy, right? So they actually had not implemented a mask policy because they had heard a lot of stories about where things have gone wrong, right? And so this is not, you know, this is not only Asian um, immigrants kind of dealing with these fears, but um, it is particularly, um, is particularly um, more uh, tense and kind of, um, sort of anxiety prone because you have not only kind of this, uh, you know, the, the sphere belligerence, right, by customers um, against masks in general, but then also specifically because they are Asian, right? So that's kind of, um, this is an example of um, how risks are getting, um, multiple risks are, are getting negotiated and say like the biological risk of, uh, the, of the virus is kind of then receiving um, less priority than uh, the risk of physical violence in this context. Okay, um, the next um, slide um, is, uh, you know, we have um, also, we're very tentative to this idea of the uneven impacts of economic and legal intervention. So I very much agree with um, the conversation we just had about how, um, while, at, while on one hand, there is, uh, there appears to be a lot of um, uh, support and satisfaction with the fact that uh, Biden, the Biden administration is pushing through um, hate crime legislation to deal with the problem of um, anti-Asian racism. I am personally concerned, my team is also concerned about what the impacts of this, um, this type of legislation are and how this um, will necessarily lead to greater policing, which has impacted people, right? Um, and so we're seeing how the uneven impacts of um, of some of these interventions are happening, you know, both in terms of the legal um, aspects as well as the economic aspects. So just, I'll start with the legal because we just spoke about that. Um, so, um, you know, some of the people that we spoke to uh, talk about how 
um, they are um, how, you know, they're undocumented, right? And actually, so the, the legal and the economic often go together, right? So they're undocumented. Um, and so not only do they feel like they can't necessarily access some of the economic policies that are intended, say like unemployment, right? That are intended for um, a, you know, for US citizens, uh, either because they um, literally don't meet that criteria or because they have a fear of what happens if they access uh, these types of services. Um, they, there's also this fear of policing, right? So it's it's both, um, and so you, you, you can see how um, being, um, uh, being afraid to access resources is also related to the sphere of deportation, right? So um, what we are trying to, um, what these quotes show is that a lot of these, um, these interventions that are seen as being supportive of people living in the US, you know, um, regardless of their race, as well as specifically for Asian Americans, um, can have these very uneven impacts, right? And can be, you know, very um, concerning for a lot of people. Uh, so now I'm going to transition to talking about some of the uh, the issues and discussions that have been coming up in terms of Asian Americans and other um, you know uh, racial groups, specifically um, Black Americans. I'm and so I'm going to start off by um, just showing some examples from social media and news uh, media. So the first uh, on the left is a series of tweets, right, and on the right is. Um, an article that I saw published, you know, uh, kind of shared very widely. It's from this uh, uh, website called Hello Giggles, which is, I guess, um, started by an actress named Zoe Deschanel. Um, and so, and the, on the left, you see how um, uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, who's kind of a well-known um, journalist, public intellectual, who had come out with the um, 1619, I think that's right, number 1619 project, which is about slavery. Um, and the sort of foundation of the US um, had um, had tweeted after the um, after the shootings in Atlanta that um, she you know about her concern with the rise of anti-Asian violence um, and then she kind of drew connections between anti-black violence and anti-Asian racism as well. Um, and then you know um, a uh, a fairly prominent um, Asian. American um, uh, writer, former, I think, uh, professor at Georgetown, I think, um, you know, talk, uh, kind of uh, talked back at Nicole Hannah Jones and said that she had been gaslighting Asian Americans for the past year, right? Similarly, you see this kind of language of gaslighting again in the article on the right. Um, and what's interesting about this article, and I saw it, I, I, I first just saw it kind of very casually seeing people on Facebook sharing. Um, this article saying, oh, the, this is kind of, this really speaks to my experience, right? And the main thrust of the article is not um, against white supremacy, but rather is targeted to other people of color, right? Um, where um, the article argues that um, Asian Americans are, um, you know, constantly in this position of being told to wait our turn or being told to, um, being told that our issues don't matter or that we are racist, right? And so, um, so these are some of the discussions that come out with this. Um, and so we were, we we're very kind of curious about um, some of these discussions. And then at the same time, what we noticed was that in our own interviews, um, and again, this speaks to kind of the skew in our sample as well as uh, the potential for interviewees to, um, to not want to, uh, to kind of maybe expecting that we felt certain ways and not wanting to sound themselves racist, but um, we noticed that um, even though um, we did not, in none of the interviewers, right, when speaking to our interviewees, um, brought up the issue of um, of anti-black racism or Black Lives Matter. None of us brought it up. But then, whenever we asked our interviewees about their experiences of um, of uh, of uh, anti-Asian racism, they would bring up this com comparisons, right? And so what we, uh, as we kind of were thinking about this, what we um, began settling on, and we're still kind of working through some of these ideas, is that rather than these representing opposites, right? Where one is, um, one side is saying uh, that they feel um, ignored or gaslit um, by other people of color and the other um, being supportive, we, we're kind of thinking about this actually as a spectrum, right? So what is the consequence of some of these comparisons? What are some of the consequences of um, Asian Americans seeing themselves and seeing their issues um, through the lens of other um, issues impacting other communities of color, right? And, and I say this kind of knowing that like, it's not such a clear 
um, you know, uh, delineation of different groups, right? And you also have uh, people who are of, you know, who are multiracial as well, right? But um, this sort of conceptualization of Asian American issues can only be understood vis-a-vis -vis, um, how they measure up to the kind of uh, uh, racial justice issues of other groups is something that we were kind of interested in that we wanted to look at. So what we found was that, so we kind of found like three different threads. So uh, the first one being um, a negotiation of Asian invisibility, right? So um, some of these quotes, we um, we can see how, you know, people were uh, like, again, you know, what, what we're seeing in terms of uh, what some of those, um, the articles and tweets showed where people are saying that they are getting, um, they are kind of receiving, uh, uh, comments from other people dismissing them, right? What we're seeing is that a lot of people are actually um, uh, in some ways kind of um, internally um, kind of uh, telling themselves that their issues are not important, right? So we see in these quotes, it's not necessarily that people are saying, oh, you know, my friend who um, is black said X, Y, Z to me that my issues don't matter, but rather people themselves are kind of drawing these comparisons, right? And so we're kind of interested in where that comes from. So this one person on the left says, that um, that oh our business hasn't been looted um, is not that bad is not worthy of a story right so uh, like they're already kind of drawing these comparisons right um, and um, uh, similarly you know on the right uh, somebody saying you know what's my COVID discrimination in comparison to all these murders right so that's another um, kind of comparison that people make. Um, and then uh, the other theme, and then we also have a theme about identity, which I'm not gonna kind of talk about too much, um, but um, the other theme is thinking about anti-Blackness and solidarity, right? So um, we see how a lot of times how people are kind of understanding their um, relationships is through, you know, some of them have their own experiences of growing up in multiracial communities. Um, but I think that also many people who don't necessarily have those backgrounds and are thinking about um, how their families understand racial issues and um, how their families may or may not kind of participate in anti-Blackness, how that kind of becomes a major concern, right? So um, one of the um, interviews I did um, was with um, a young uh, woman who is in college and her parents run a, a Chinese, um, a series of Chinese restaurants. And it was, it was a major kind of sticking point because her parents um, had kind of bought into a lot of this anxiety around looting, which is very racialized, um, and didn't really understand why her she and her sister cared about these issues and even was very frustrated with them, you know, going to um, Black Lives Matter uh, solidarity protests and things like that, right? So, um, so a, a lot of times you know, we're seeing uh, as part of this comparison is also this negotiation of anti-Blackness within Asian American communities. Um, and oftentimes this is kind of positioned uh, generationally, though I think that the assumption that it is primarily generational is something that um, comes out a lot through discourse and isn't, we don't necessarily have enough evidence, I think, to say that it is, that is such a clear binary, you know, based on age, right? Um, so that's kind of where I'll end for now. Um, and, um, I just encourage you to um, check out our project more. You can learn more about um, our team. Um, you can also learn about some of our partnerships. So as Elena mentioned, you know, we have a partnership with UNESCO. Um, and also we are currently, um, you know, expanding our recruitment and looking for people to join our study. Uh, so, um, you know, we'd definitely love to hear from you and encourage you to check this out. So I think I'm going to pass the microphone. Um, can, uh, let me just, who's, is it to Stephanie I'm passing the microphone to? Is that? To Shonda. Oh, Shonda, I'm so sorry. Okay, so, so to Shonda, sorry for that. So thank you so much um, and looking forward to uh, the questions. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, y'all. Let me just share my screen. So um, my assimilated name is pronounced Shonda and um, my Khmer name is actually pronounced Chinda. Um, I recall an experience in third grade, uh, started since third grade when just teachers and administrators just couldn't get my name right. So um, I started reclaiming my Cambodian name about five or seven years ago, and I embrace both. So you can address me as such. Um, so yeah, I'm the founding executive director of Arise, we, um, which stands for the Alliance of Rhode Island Southeast Asians for Education. And um, our work is, um, um, our mission is to um, be combined 
um, leadership development as well as community organizing for education justice. Um, this is a picture of one of our actions that I'll talk more about as I go through the slides. I think it's really important um, to share a little bit of who I am and, and how my identity impacts the ways in which I occupy, um, occupy spaces and carry out that work. Um, the picture to the right is a picture of my mom holding me at the refugee camp in Kawadang. Um, I, I was born in the same year Sarath was, so he was probably like um, crawling around when I was crawling around because we were the same age. Um, I love to, I, 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 a part, so I have mixed feelings about this picture. A part of me loves to show this picture um, because it really shows, um, um, you know, the conditions in which we came to this country. Um, and Sarath, you know, video, I, I watch it so many times, but I still cry and I have sort of like this emotional sort of attachment to it every time I watch the video. Um, uh, beneath that, what you don't see in the picture beneath that is sort of a code that was unique to each person. Just like you're going into the supermarket, it's like a scanned barcode. And that was what was attached to us. Um, I love showing this picture because um, it um, is one of two baby pictures that I have. Um, my parents came to the States when I was eight months old, January of um, 1981. Um, they first resettled in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, to be specific. Um, my, da my dad stayed there for about a year, and then he moved the family to Rhode Island because one of his best friends became the president of the Cambodian Society of Rhode Island, and there was a lot um, much more organizing in Rhode Island to bring visibility to what was happening in Cambodia. So he moved um, the family over to, um, to Rhode Island. Um, I'm also um, a wife <laughs> to a very beautiful black man. Um, that's, a, that's a huge part of how I show up in spaces. Um, as you can see, I have two beautiful children. Um, Amaya is 12 and baby Justice is two. Um, they are absolutely biracial um, and very much black presenting. <laughs> First generation refugee, <laughs> mom of two black children and wife to a black man. Um, quickly, this is our mission and our vision. Um, I, def I mentioned our mission, our, our vision is, you know, we hope that Rhode Island is, um, is a thriving Rhode Island that's fueled by empowered and engaged young people. <clears throat> this is, these are our values. So Vivian, you know, I think like Vivian and Saraf talked about and, and touched on um, sort of how do we show up, right? The, so these are the values that anchor us and these are the, the, the values that um, we approach our work through, right? We approach our work through a solidarity lens, um, recognizing that um, our work is done through a black liberation lens, which means that like our liberation is tied to black liberation and we must do our parts to, to end anti-blackness, right? Anti-blackness is, is, is very, very um, prevalent in the Asian community and specifically the, the Southeast Asian community. It's, I see it in my family. And my daughter, my 12 year old daughter is always having to check her grandparents all the time. Like, my, it's like grandma, that's a microaggression. Like, this is what that means. This is why it's harmful, right? That's very real. Um, justice, right? We, it, it's it's important, right? We, I think like um, Vivian mentioned like the hashtag stop AAPI hate. Part of that controversy is around this, um, is it coming at the expense of saying, um, no, stop white supremacy. Is this white supremacy ideology in its tenets that are carrying out the harm, the very same harm um, of indigenous folks, of black folks, of folks of color, of marginalized communities, right? Um, so it's about really getting to the root cause um, and restoring it through a restorative justice lens. Um, and then our last value is intersectionality. It's you know, um, believing in that folks should really um, show up as their whole selves and co-creating spaces with young people where, um, you know, where we're honoring their multifaceted identities. Like we have specifically, you know, um, Southeast Asian identifying students, East Asian identifying students and multiracial students, right? And um, really honoring uh, the different communities and the histories and the shared struggle. Um, this is a very important quote for us um, because I think like for, for us and for, and for, for, our, for our Southeast Asian families, like I know that we can name that our parents are always like, hey, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, right? Like you're going to have that American dream. And 
we we were told in the in the refuge in the right before we came to the states in the refugee camps that like hey the american dream requires you to get an education once you have that then you're good we know that that is not true we know that that is a very small part of that equation right um, we were never told about the systems um, that are working against us in all the ways that it does. So part of our work is um, um, helping young people deepen their analysis and to increase self-efficacy, to increase self, um, their social consciousness. Um, and for them to say like, hey, this system does not work for me. How do I then kick down that system and create this other system, right? So it's not just about teaching them to navigate these very systems that are, by the way, not working for them, but it's about teaching them to create new systems that work for them and to ser that serves all people. So Saraf mentioned this, right? Like I, the, the thing that I will add is um, 1.3 million um, Southeast Asians, folks indigenous to Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam, right? What is not known is that this is the largest refugee resettlement effort in the history of the United States people. I didn't learn that until I was uh, um, in, 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 in college because the, the, this was not taught to me. No, my parents were not also openly talking about what happened in Cambodia. Um, and we also know that if you're looking at research, you'll see that um, research on resettlement efforts were a complete failure. I know that in Rhode Island, PRISM has done an amazing job capturing what actually went down. Um, there were social service agencies who didn't know that they were um, receiving Southeast Asians until the night before. So if you didn't know you were getting guests the night before, how are you supposed to prep for that? Um, because our work is rooted in education justice, Saraf, so you know, um, talked a little bit about how um, aggregated data continues to fuel the model minority myth, does extreme harm to the specifically the Southeast Asian community. Um, so I'd really like to focus my presentation on um, sort of how um, Asian hate, Asian disenfranchisement, Asian marginalization shows up in the education system. So um, this is an infographic from our 2010 um, community survey and census. Um, so when you look at the educational attainment data for all Asians, you see it's at 61%. And as y'all can visibly see, um, when you start looking at the um, um, Southeast Asian um, folks, you'll see that we're at 9%, 8%, um, and 19%. Um, I, this is a illustration of how we carry out our work. Um, all of our supports programs and um, interventions fall in one of these five, um, five um, groups. So um, civic responsibility and social consciousness, academic preparedness. We even developed a curriculum called Algebra, um, Math Through the Lens of Social Justice. Um, where young people were learning um, algebra through the transatlantic um, slave trade. Um, Pathways to the future, we know that all of our young, we're not gonna keep telling our young people that your only way out is to college. Not everyone is going to college. Not everyone's going to higher ed. Um, Post-secondary access, um, that's the space where we're um, equipping our young people to navigate the college um, admissions process. And then um, in the Southeast Asian community, intergenerational trauma is very real. Like we have the highest undiagnosed PTSD. Um, it's extremely also critical for us to be building through a multiracial and intergenerational lens. So I know that Elena was like, hey, Shonda, like, tell us how do we work with young people? Like, how do we, you know, how do we get um, young people to fully engage? I have to give love and a shout out to my anti-racist um, educators who put together, um, and our organizing toolkit is evolutionary, but I'm gonna just uh, show you three uh, sort of different steps in our organization um, toolkit that that is very much part of our political education training and development for our young people. So like really um, <laughs> sort of getting young people to think about um, and, um, think about the root cause analysis and framework as they look at issues, right? Like, how are we connecting these symptoms? How are we identifying the central problems? And how we, do we put those problems in the context of history? 
like I think like one of the other things was also like I know that amongst our young people, you know, um, they were thinking that anti Asian violence and racism was something new. Um, Bob just named the legacy of anti Asian violence, which even predated us coming to the States. Um, just another illustration um, that we use with our young people. Um, and number two, like we're, we're, we're providing young people um, space to engage in discussion and facil facilitation. We think it's very, it's very important, um, imperative for them to be organizers and activists. They must be able to present the information, present their findings, right? Um, and engage in conversations, be able to have um, um, conversations that deepen their analysis, but also be open to learning, right? Um, one of the things that we definitely center is and value in our space that works, that works y'all is um, elevating and amplifying young people's experiential knowledge more than intellectual knowledge. And I wish more adults would do that. Um, young people are closest <laughs> um, to the issue. They know what they're combating. They're the ones who are sitting in those chairs. So, um, you know, our role is just to facilitate facilitate how we advocate and organize. And then three is our um, critical consumption. So, you know, I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't have Facebook, I didn't have, I, you know, Twitter, I, all of that good stuff. But like really um, young people, we are bombarded with information every single day. So how are we equipping young people to critically consume that information, right? Um, what are the messages in the media? Um, how are you criti critically analyzing that text? Um, what's the context? What, what's the topic? What lens is this sort of article, a message um, um, through? And who is the audience um, that's intended to hear this message? So that's part of our organizing toolkit to lay the foundation um, of what happens in our political education trainings with our young people. And this is what they produced, right? Like these are just sort of a list of um, the, the problems we've identified and the campaigns they've taken on. Like when we were first founded, of course, like, you know, Rhode Island um, was not disaggregating their data. We know that data disaggregation has been a an over of a decade sort of national fight, right? Like um, I believe we lost by a few votes. When Arise was founded, um, our first campaign was the All Students Count Act. We became the third state to pass a bill that required RIDE to disaggregate um, educational attainment data under Asian. So they, they now have to um, capture ethnicity data. Um, now, we passed that in 2016, 2017 legislative session. I will say um, we stood on the shoulders of the work of PRISM, who's been pushing for data disaggregation um, for forever. Um, the pro what people don't understand is also, um, <laughs> yes, it's hard to pass legislation, but y'all, it's even much harder to ensure that this legislation is implemented with fidelity or is implemented in the ways in which you intended the legislation to be implemented. So right now for the, you know, we've been battling with RIDE um, because they have not implemented it with fidelity. Um, and when Arise was first founded, we knew like, hey, no one's talking about our history, right? Y'all, y'all, you know, y'all know, you know, the the war as the Vietnam War. We know it as a secret war, right, in Southeast Asia. Um, and one of the things we knew we wanted to do was um, develop a curriculum that would center what went down in Southeast Asia through the lens of power, privilege, and oppression. Right. And, and and as part of that curriculum, young people were being taught to be historians and researchers and storytellers. Right. They were capturing stories of our Southeast Asian elders and presenting the stories in the ways um, that honored them and honored our history and also um, was a way to tackle and disrupt intergenerational trauma. Like I always say, my family history is given to me very fragmented. Because my parents at a dinner table would be like, yeah, we lost your brother to this. Like my parents lost four kids that I, my, bro my brothers and sisters I've never met. Um, 
in the war, in the genocide, um, and they're not openly talking about what went down. So what happens is we're on it, you know, my parents are unintentionally um, passing down that trauma. Um, so part of our work um, is to disrupt that intergenerational trauma. Um, and then you'll see, right, you know, Elena said we have some action happening led by PSU Youth and the Past Coalition demanding for um, counselors, not cops, because there's there, there are, there's policing in school buildings that have high concentration of um, black and brown students, right? So Sarah names the school to prison to now deportation pipeline. That is, that is very real. Our young people are engaged in, um, they read the new Jim Crow last year, dissected the book, right? Learned about what the war on drugs was really about. Um, watched the 13 documentary, engaged in um, critical conversation. Um, they're not reading the color of law with our anti-racist educators because they need to know that that like we're not poverty is concentrated and who was responsible for that concentration of poverty that was extremely intentional and in understanding how these systems carry out um you know the marginalization and the oppression and yes we are in the forefront of the cook versus Ramondo. Um, work, young people are part of the plaintiffs. Rhode Island, if you all don't know, um, adequate education is not a constitutional right. Um, so we're actually we're actually suing suing the state. And if we win, right, it's going to be a long fight. If we win, we would be winning in a constitutional right to an adequate education for all students. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned, we stood on the shoulders of um, PRISM, organizations like PRISM and other national orgs who are leading the um, disaggregation, um, data disaggregation fight. And the way that we approached this work was that, yes, data disaggregation is a Southeast Asian issue and a civil rights issue, right? So we organize multiracially and intergenerationally. Um, these are the folks who were involved. We won 65 to five in the house and a unanimous vote, um, you know, on the Senate floor it was, it was, you know, a, a, a huge success. And at the time, so many PRISM youth came out and testified. We had policy folks, we had the racial justice coalition that comprised other folks who are not Southeast Asian identifying. Um, we had the four largest school districts that had concentration of Southeast Asian students come out and testify as well. Um, just some coverage. Um, and this is this a picture of like our, our founding youth leaders who um, we're also very intentional with how um, we're building a BIPOC leadership pipeline, right? So our young people, our youth leaders, and they become youth facilitators, lead organizers. So we have young people who went through the youth leadership program who are now in college and who are serving as lead organizers and helping to move that work because no one else, no one else is building BIPOC leadership, right? Like we have to do that ourselves. This is our um, a picture from last summer. Y'all see their mask from our, the, our newest youth leaders um, cohort who are leading our campaign um, work. And just, just some more sort of artifacts around how we're very intentional um, with the work that we're doing. This is, you know, our student-centered ethnic studies. And what we mean by student-centered is that, you know, our ethnic studies curriculum, there are parts of the curriculum where young people are like, hey, I want to learn more about the slave codes. Because while it's a focus on what went down in Southeast Asia, we're talking about imperialism, we're talking about colonialism, we're talking about the four eyes of oppression and how that shows up, we're talking about hegemony, right? So um, when we say it's student-centered, young people actually driving aspects of the curriculum that they wanna learn, but they're also encouraged to say like, yo, we need you to do your own research and come challenge us. Because that that that's the real power of education, right? Like, hey, you're missing this, um, can we add this context? Just more artifacts of our Councils Not Cops campaign, as you can see, um, you know, um, it's our black and brown students, y'all. Our school's PVD, we were actually, um, you know, founded because the state took over the Providence schools and we're not centering the voices of those who are most impacted. So our students of color were like, hey, 
um, your takeover plan needs to center our voices because we're the ones who are most impacted. And this is just um, a picture from our Cook versus Raimondo hearing mm -mm. illustration. Yes. And yes, this is created by young people, our young organizers who are in high school, y'all. So it's, how, it's about how do we leverage our young people's power and talents and work to elevate the work that they want to do and that they want to push. Ethnic studies. So um, PSU, Prime Student Union had, um, you know, led by young people as well, had won their fight for pushing for ethnic studies in Providence. Um, and it demanded that seven high schools in Providence provided ethnic studies. The issue was there wasn't a curriculum identified um, to do that, nor were teachers equipped to deliver an ethnic studies sort of curriculum. Um, they were not received, you know, they didn't receive the training. Simultaneously, Arise was developing our own curriculum. And I guess the school district heard about it. They reached out to us. We ended up partnering with high schools that would offer core credits um, for this course because we were like, no, we're not partnering with you because you're doing an elective credit. We wanted to make sure that the way that we were doing our work was lifting up the importance of um, this counter narrative. Um, yeah, right? Like, yeah, we supported the March for Lives, but our young people was like, hey, how about the black and brown student, you know, black and brown young people who are being gunned down by police, right? Like, how about us? Like, there's sort of this national move when there are, uh, you know, um, white folks, right, getting hurt. Um, so our young people is like, no, 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 no. We need to lift up this narrative as well. Um, young, you know, th th I think these are just artifacts of like how we're building and organizing multiracially and intergenerationally like right like we are seen as the hard to count communities for the census so we ran workshops on why the census was important to, for our young people they ran workshops for their parents their parents ran workshops for their communities and we really were able to organize with other um community-based organizations to to get the count out um so these are just some of our youth leaders and their parents our um, Black and Cambodian student, right, both of them, women, led our um, Gen Z votes campaign, right? So, the, you, know, we're, you know, schools are not talking about the importance of the civic responsibility piece. So um, all of these infographics were created by young people, um, and they led the campaign where they encouraged their peers to register. Like Nehemiah was a first-time voter. Melly, who created these um, illustrations, was also a first-time voter, and they were organizing their peers to register to vote and getting their parents to register to vote. Um, also like um, Providence, right? Providence, um, you know, we were pushing for the removal of the, the word plantation, Providence plantations, which we knew was extremely harmful to our black communities, right? And our black students led that fight. This is their virtual campaign and our Asian identifying students, our Latinx identifying students um, support it, right? Support it, that work. And we were successful. Um, we also know that COVID impacted communities of color um, very disproportionately. What was happening in Rhode Island though, um, was that these ethnicities were not captured. So when they were talking about how communities were impacted, um, there was a lifting up of the Black and Latinx community without um, sort of the Southeast Asian community because they was not capturing that data. But when in fact, we were going to funerals every other week. So we knew what was happening. We came together with community-based organizations, um, created a solidarity fund that would move resources to folks who were really impacted by the pandemic because all of the federal and state support were not hitting the folks who really needed it. And lastly, I'll end with, yes, y'all, we, we have eight junior flames. That's what they're calling themselves, right? They're middle school students. So we are 
introducing our, our middle school political education training, um, young people, they're helping to co-create the curriculum. So, I mean, we, we, we like to say that Arise's work is on this youth engagement spectrum where part, aspects of our work are youth-centered, um, youth-informed, and youth-led, right? So um, anything that we're creating, we're typically co-creating with young people, and they usually um, sort of uh, uh, have, have the last say. I know that I have two board members here, Bob and Saraf. Every time I'm going in there with a new sort of uh, <laughs> organizational chart, they're like, Shonda, can this chart get any flatter? Well, that's what we want to do, right? Like, we want to <laughs> continue to um, challenge how systems um, of, of, of white supremacy practices show up in our space, because we're all fighting against white supremacy and white supremacy ideologies and its tenets. So I will pause there, y'all. Thank you so much to all of our fabulous speakers. Um, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A chat. Yeah. Uh, and Bob and I will facilitate some of those, encouraging you all to um, add additional questions as well. Uh, Bob? Yeah, uh, let me just thank the um, in incredibly, uh, you know, moving, informative, inspiring speakers. I, I, you know, this is just really wonderful. Um, let me take a, a question um, that one of the um, audience um, members uh, wrote in. Um, why do you think the varied instances of violence against Asian diasporic peoples in the United States is consistently made invisible in public discourse. I'm specifically thinking of all the connections Dr. Lee made and what forces prevent uh, more people from thinking collectively about anti-Asian violence at a public level. And, and I might add to that if I, if I could, and you know, it, it's not just the violence that's invisible, but this incredible work um, that people are doing um, in, in their communities and between communities um, you know, that kind of both intersectional and cross-racial um, work that's, that's being done out there uh, is also invisible. And, I, and that's a question I think, um, you know, I want to uh, raise here. I, maybe I can jump in. Um, so I don't have like the, um, uh, a complete answer for that, but I, I think that um, I, I've been thinking about this question of visibility a lot um, in the past few months over the past year. Um, and especially after Atlanta, um, and I know I know that many, many people have had this experience, but um, we got inundated with requests. And I know that um, groups such as Red Canary Song, um, who have been working on issues around uh, massage workers' rights and sex workers' rights uh, for a long time, um, also got inundated, right? And I, I think that, um, Part of this issue is is a sort of um, the sort of capriciousness of, of uh, visibility, right? So uh, being visible within very specific contexts and after very specific events, um, I think that is part of the issue. And I so I think that um, it's not only an issue of how people discuss racial politics and awareness. I think it's also a structural issue in terms of media, right? In terms of funding. So, um, because, you know, as we know, like it's when you get sudden visibility, right? And then you get an influx of funds or resources, which, you know, can happen, doesn't always happen. Um, that's also an issue too, right? Because there's not necessarily this kind of um, infrastructure to field all of that, right? And that becomes its own labor. So I, I think that um, a lot of it is is fundamentally this um, this inequality of resources and how um, there are um, uh, the sort of the ways in which resources are distributed so unequally within our economy, within the nonprofit sector, within the university. Um, and how that really kind of privileges certain types of um, speakers, certain types of issues more than others, um, and kind of can be really difficult from a grassroots level. So I think that um, if we had a different type of economy that wasn't so dependent on attention from the media in very specific moments, when the 24 news hour cycle is interested in issues that relate to us, I think we would have, um, there'd be greater capacity to keep the attention, public attention on these issues um, more regularly. But I, so I think, I think a lot of it is a structural issue um, financially um, 
and in terms of power um, in that sense, right? So, you know, it's in some t in some ways like we we kind of borrow time from the media, like when they give it to us, right? So I think those that kind of contributes to that. Thanks so much, Vivian. Um, our next question um, is uh -huh. quite long and quite personal, and uh, I will be posting it uh, in into the chat. But Twyla Rochelle Calvin writes, um, I am a woman Marine that served in Southwest Asia and the Philippines and Japan. Um, loved the people and culture, came home, first worked as a police officer, went on you know, numerous calls throughout the community. And then um, just this past Saturday was at a grocery store and an Asian lady made a racial slur to me. She was not aware that I understood. I was polite as always, but it was incredibly hurtful. Um, Twyla Rochelle goes on to ask, why is there such a schism between our two groups? We are both marginalized. We we're both sodomized. We we're both forced into resettlement from our home soils and we we're both targets of hate to this day. My great grandfather was part of the protests to support the Indochina Migration Refugee Act as were many other black clergymen and politicians. I'd love to turn this over to Sarah if you're willing to answer. Sure, thank you, Elena. Um, first I wanna say thank you to Ayla. Thank you for sharing your story and for sharing your pain. Um, thank you and thank your family uh, for, for sponsoring us when we need a refuge. Thank you and your thank you for your great grandfather, great, great grandfather, and many other black civil rights leaders who thought the injustice that was happening in Southeast Asia and spoke against it and worked to provide us a pathway here. I'm reminded of Dr. Martin Luther King's famous speech on April 4th, 1967, where he delivered at Riverside Church in New York City. It's one of his famous speeches in Pop Yon, Vietnam. Um, I just want to read a quick passage from it. Um, because as a young organizer, trying to make sense of who I am in the movement and where my position is in this country, I remember hearing this speech for the first time. I remember how much it resonated with me. So I'll just share a quick thing. I'm going to post it in the chat, too. Um, so, so he says that we are taking young Black men who have been crippled um, by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to see them together in the same schools. So we watched them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a poor village, but we realized they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. And I think about that speech because I think about um, when, I, when I was a young person, a Southeast Asian young person, seeing sort of the anti-Blackness in my community, but also seeing the anti refugee anti immigrant sentiments from everybody else. I, um, I, and um, I was trying to make sense. And I knew that when knowing that there was a massive movement and the war in South Asia to remove US military from my home countries, it, may, it gave me so much hope. And even though I know solidarity shouldn't be transactional, it gave me hope that Black radical movements and folks understood that imperialism was happening abroad and made the connections to the oppression here domestically. And it made me understand better why Southeast Asians in the United States must join the fight to end all wars, dismantle US military, and to help give a road to abolition and to stand for black lives. So, you know, anti-blackness um, anti is in the US thing is all across the globe, very much like white supremacy, South Asian refugee communities, even though we are poor, even though we have faced colorism, even though we know what it feels like to be oppressed, have so much to do, so much to unravel and tap when it comes to our own anti-blackness. But I see the Han, the young daughter, who is, working to, who is also working to undo her mother's anti-blackness. I believe that there's also hope for us. Um, and the schism, I just want to say the last thing, the schism for, between communities, between South Asians and Black folks, serves to uphold racial capitalism in this country. That Asians are needed to be seen as meek and subservient and grateful for our racial position in this country in order for white supremacy to grow. And in order for us, in order for us to uphold racial capitalism, Black folks need to be seen as subhuman. I don't have any easy answers. Um, but I do, I am reminded of MLK's, uh, but Martin Luther King reminds me that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And it would take organizing and building and loving each other as black and Asian folks, as oppressed people trying to survive in this country that taught us, that need us to hate each other. Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, no real answers, but, I, um, but I'm hoping that folks, um, you know, in lifting up organizing ways of actually really building this prospect of solidarity, it's important for our work ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Sarath. Um, uh, let me follow up with another question. Um, um, 
the audience member writes, um, how do we work with local youth to organize and engage in civic engagement work? Sometimes, oftentimes youth are so busy with schools and jobs and family commitments and um, in, uh, in greater Phoenix, uh, everyone is geographically dispersed. Um, so how do we engage them and how can we get started? Uh, so perhaps this is a, a, a good question for Chanda. How do you get started? How do you, how do you pull, begin to get young people engaged? Yeah, oh Lord. Um, I think, <laughs> um, I know people are always like, how do you guys recruit um, new youth leaders, right? New political activists and organizers. And our, and our answer is always like, our current youth leaders. <laughs> Right, our current youth leaders tapping into the families and communities that we um, we already touch within our larger ecosystem. Right, like we bring ourselves to 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 the different spaces that we occupy. Right, um, and I think. Um, it's getting young people hooked on what they're interested about. Um, and they should be co creating with you like whatever sort of group of folks you folks you are trying to serve or be in service to um, or issue you're trying to address, you need to center those who are most impacted by that work. Um, they're very much part of the curriculum development. They're very much part of interviewing new youth leaders. Like I have no say in who the new youth leader cohort is. They go through the application process. They're going to schools, knocking on doors, calling their aunties. They're at churches, um, sort of um, religious temples. Um, but yeah, they're 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 the ones like y'all. I'm just the face, but I don't, they, they do all the labor. I love them. <laughs> so um, and then of course, like part of our work is to to really honor young people's time. So all of our youth leaders, we're moving resources to them and their families. Um, so we stipend them um, for the work that they love to do and that are doing. Um, so I would say engage in a community mapping exercise to really um, assess who's doing the work. Um, look into how you can join that because usually it already exists because I think that a lot of folks come in and it's like, hey, I want to do this, but haven't done the community mapping. Um, and there's already coalitions and organizations that exist to, to do that work. I mean, Arise was founded to address a gap. Trust me, the last thing I wanted to do was um, start a new nonprofit organization, knowing the odds were against me being a person of color um, and heading a nonprofit. Um, so, yeah. Thanks so much, Shanda. Um, we're going to close now, unfortunately, because we are at time, but not before another round of incredible thanks to our speakers. Thank you once again to CSREA uh, and to our media services staff, Lewis and Jason. There are a couple of other questions outstanding in the chats. Um, Sharnella has asked particularly for how to book young RI speakers to speak nationally. I think for these and other questions around people who are interested in getting involved, Thank you so much to Soraya, who's included enormous resources in the chat. We'll try to copy those uh, resources from the chat as well as contact information to get in touch with our speakers back onto the initial um, CSREA page that listed uh, the event. But in order to um, respect everybody's time, thank you all so much for being here. And um, this is an incredible place to start the discussion, uh, incredible points of future action to take and um, sending you all off well to have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.